Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, so it's my privilege to introduce uh, Professor Vimal Bakshi, today's speaker for the Institute Colloquium. Usually, the, the directors introduces the speakers of the Institute Colloquium, but unfortunately, he is not here today. The acting director is also not present in the campus. The senior deans are also not available. So I am introducing Professor Bakshi. In that way, I am lucky. Now, usually uh, the, the program goes that a picture worth a thousand words. So I have displayed here the picture, the special issue that was uh, uh, that was published by General of Physical Chemistry in honor of Professor Bakshi in 2015. So that talks all about Professor Bakshi. He is possibly the most known physical chemist of the country today. Although Professor Bhattacharya said yesterday that he is number two. <laughs> okay. uh, but still, for the for the sake of the most of our students, uh, Professor Bakshi is a professor of Indian uh, Institute of Science, Bangalore, Solid State and Structural Chemistry Department. And his main research area is the theory and the simulations of the liquid, complex systems, biological materials. That's what we are going to listen from him today. Uh, he got uh, a degree in 1975 and then PhD from the Brown University. And then he worked as a postdoctoral uh, associate with uh, two very known uh, physical chemists, uh, Professor Graham, uh, Graham Fleming and uh, Professor Oxtubi. And uh, he is the recipient of all kinds of national and uh, many international awards, including this TWS. He has published more than 400 original research papers, two books. He has a large number of research groups produced very effective and productive uh, PhD scholars. So with this, I invite Professor Bakshi to deliver today's conference. And I am the who wrote the first uh, introduction later to the Ecologium, and also uh, the director and uh, other people of the institute. So I gave a talk yesterday. This is actually the third talk in three days. Mm. And it seems like one too many. Uh, but uh, this is something which we have been working for quite a long time now, uh, protein folding and unfolding. The new therapy is, is an evolving field and it has become a major area of research. So one part which we are working now a lot is the hydrophobic post law. It's very interesting, I don't know how the students and faculty working and experience here. I always used to have only one student working on a problem, you know. So many of the papers that we wrote are just two other paper, you know. And and that worked for a very long time, for almost 30 years. The student and many a student learned maximum 
that way. And at the end of the day, it was very good, turned out to be very good for the students uh, because they get a lot, uh, lot of uh, training and a lot of uh, the recognition. But of late, what I'm finding is that that model is not going to work too much. Part of the reason is that A, we are probably working on more and more complex problems. So the student, junior student requires a lot more help on that we are growing older and we are not working that intensely with students ourselves. The, all my reason for telling all these things is that these are really complex processes. And uh, it, it is not a typical thing that you do in a uh, photophysics or in chemical kinetics where we are grown up to have a very simple chemical process, few body. These are truly many body in a very complex uh, liquid, which is water. I talked uh, some about water and freezing of water and uh, the, how water goes into, not ice, but into amorphous. And there is an exotic dynamics that water shows, which is still is keeping many people um, so the problem, let me start with defining the problem. So it will be, have, there is a problem as layers up in layers. And we, some people say the problem is solved, while some people say no, it is far from it. Why problem probably has been solved at the conceptual level, but there are many interesting sub fundamentals, not yet details, which are un, uh, not understood. So the problem of protein folding can be considered in the following way. How an extended a linear polypeptide chain with a predetermined is an important sequence of amino acid residues. You know, when you do lysozyme or ribonuclease or any protein, it is the same, uh, uh, same sequence. And that folds into exactly the same redemption of negative state. Lysozyme goes to lysozyme, ribonuclease, myoglobin, they go to their own state. And these are very complex process. So this thing, how does it go? Is the polyfolding problem. Then unfolding, so since these are very difficult to understand and uh, extremely difficult also to study in computer simulation, we have not been able to simulate only very few uh, small proteins uh, by now huge amount of uh, computational uh, resources have been brought in. And we still cannot do anything which is more than 50 amino acid long. Those things we cannot fold in computer. So the other way then, since you cannot go this way, the other way is also naturally important because much of the diseases are from the unfolding of proteins. That we do the opposite That we now unfold it by using the natural and we destroy its biological activity and it is not fully open, but partly open. So, uh, so this is the uh, two issues that I took, and you see there are many beautiful uh, questions coming. So again, going to little deeper, what we understand by protein protein problem. This is much of the time is an activated process. Unfolded state and the folded state are both minima, free energy minima. Under uh, 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 the ambient conditions, most of the proteins we deal with, the most of the proteins which have a unique native state, are local free energy. Uh, the free energy minimum is uh, deeper than the unfolded state. But however, there is a barrier. And you have to go and the barrier is not very large. It's very, very interesting. Uh, it is not very large. And uh, yet, this process is very slow. So there is a lot of entropic thing that go in, not just uh, A. No. So we will we'll talk about that a little bit. One important thing about protein folding is that when it goes to a state like that, which is an order, I call that an ordered state. But here, if I fold this unfolded thing to folded thing, I will see again and again, look at these two, these strands are called beta sheets. It will be there, the same, and the in between the where the uh, soap, but in a hollow region is not a hollow, that's why all the amino acid side chains are packed. There is a problem with the Riemann diagram. This is actually fairly high density close pack state. So let's see if there is a uh, phenyl alanine here, 
then phenyl alanine, let's say they just call it phenyl alanine, alanine 18. And see, there is a phenyl alanine here, which will say 42. Phenyl alanine 18 here, and the phenyl 42 will pack the same way, in the same orientation, every time you fold it. Okay. So this packing, this is called contact pair formation. So specific kind of contact pair. So the, again, an example I always see, and as for example, if you do a sodium chloride, you take salt, you make a solution of that, then you cool it and sodium chloride precipitates out. You get a crystal. You melt it again and, and, do, uh, and again uh, you press it down. Now let's say I can number sodium and chlorine. What you see, every time you precipitate out the crystal and get what are the neighbor leaves, nearest neighbor. What are the uh, uh, chloride? Chlorine ions around the sodium. You number them. Every time you precipitate, you see every time the nearest neighbor leaks is changing. Okay. For example, I can do another example. I tell you to quickly leave the room and then again come back. And just find the empty seats that you find. If you do that, you will find your nearest neighbor list again has changed. You don't have the same guy sitting next to you. That is a crystallization that you don't care. You care about the lattice. You don't care about the uh, you care about the basis. You don't care about who is occupying that. But not in protein folding. Protein folding, the same pair has to be there. What does it mean? Mean if I tell you now go out and again come back, but make sure all of you have the same <coughs> neighbor uh, neighbor. Then what will happen? It will be extremely slow. You have to find this guy, okay, the guy who was next to you is somewhere there, he has to come and sit next to you. This is a, we call it entropically demanding. It's highly entropically costly. That to have the same contact here. Very important. So note the difference from liquid solid phase transition. Immense entropy cost. Yeah. And that is one of the reasons people have really uh, not lost interest in this problem and it has certain beauty of its own. Now, how does it happen? Now, one part which people understood very early, even in the 1950s, is that you have the, there are hydrophobic and hydrophobic phyllic groups in the amino acid, like arginine, methionine, ascorbic acid. They are hydrophilic, they like water, they love water. Then you have alanine, phenylalanine, and they don't like water. The way it happens, they don't so the amino acids who don't like each other, they pack inside for the hydrophobic core. And the ones who love water, they are outside, they are hydrophilic. So you have a surface like arginine, like isocyanine. The isocyanine, you will be surprised to know it has 11 arginine. You know, the 129 amino acids, it has 11 arginine. You know, almost 10% arginine. And they are all on surface. Okay. And then you have 5 lysine, which is also charged. And so the, all these charged groups are outside. And he said, so the question is, how do they do it? How do you arrange these things? What is the process? Is there a basic principle? Is there an energy principle, entropy principle? How do you think about it? One of them, that when you start forming, that we know from uh, polymer, that there is something called hydrophobic collapse, and we'll talk about that, that hydrophobic groups come, want to come close to each other in order to avoid the water. And that is called hydrophobic collapse. That is the initial part. But that part is not difficult to understand. Then is the long range contact, long range contact formation of these uh, amino acid residues like hydrophobic need to be next to hydrophobic. That really is a demanding. So this is the Nobel Prize winning famous work of Antonsen. He did it over many years. Got the Nobel Prize in 1972, and he did the nucleus. He did the lysozyme. He did several more. So this is the nucleus. So. This is a reborn again, but without the secondary structure, just showing the contacts. It has one, two, three, four disulfide bonds. The native ribonic test, which is this, biologically active, I put it in a uh, molar urea and uh, another uh, beta market tunnel, another than denaturant, and it opens up. It opens up and goes into this kind of string like object. Now, look one thing that this. 58, look at the, so this is the contour distance. First one is 28, 40, it goes like that. Look at here, 58 is bonded to 110. It has really no reason to be bonded so far. It can as well form a disulfide bond to 65. Okay? So 95 is bonded to 40. 
these are the position numbering of the cysteine eyes or uh, cysteine deciduous uh, along the uh, ribonucleus control. But when I remove the urea and uh, take out uh, beta market tunnel, this guy folds back into the, its native state. But it folds back exactly, exactly the same thing. The, the most important is that again 58 goes to 110, 95 goes to 40. So this is what I mean the predetermined contact formation. That the pair contact is preserved. And that's an extremely, extremely difficult thing. And how does it happen? Why does it happen? So, and this is kind of interesting story, it's an old war, but I still like to talk about it because it gives a wonderful idea to the young students. So Andrew said, then formulated a hypothesis. He said, the native state with this kind of particular arrangement forms because this is the most stable state. Okay, so Andrew's hypothesis was very popular hypothesis. If you <coughs> take old Leningar or Rupert Strayer old books, Go to the first edition. Uh, you will see Anfield's hypothesis is discussed. You know, these books in biology or biophysical chemistry, they evolved very, every edition was really new book. It's very interesting. Not in physical chemistry books. Our physical chemistry books with Ostwald and Arrhenius remain more or less the same, but not in bio, uh, biophysics or biophysical chemistry. So he, to 1968, around this time, Anfield was doing all these things. Levinthal, Seri Levinthal came out with a two same paper, but the same paper published two places and one and a half page. And he said, okay, let me, he goes check that native state is the most stable state, is a guiding principle. He said, okay, let me now do a musical calculations. How long does it take for a protein to fold into its native state? So he said, okay, let me do a very simple back of the envelope calculation that, uh, uh, how do I, how long will it take? Very simple calculation. He said, the important point he made, which was not made by Anthony and others, he said, if something to be known as stable, say, say I know one guy is the, is, the, is the tallest guy. In order to know he is the tallest in this class, say, I need to sample many people. At least I need to sample out of these 100 or so you are here, I need to sample at least 15 or 20. Oh, this guy is really tall. So in order to know one state is stable, I need to sample some of things. Okay. Otherwise I won't know. So he said, let me take how long it times to take to sample a certain fraction, like 5% of the states. So search for the most stable state. How does it go? So he said, let me do the following simple thing. I have 101 amino acids. Each amino acid have just three states. Then there are these many configurations. 3 into uh, 100 and then 5 into 10 to 47 configurations. Now, so we have this astronomically large, huge number of configurations. Now, let me see, the protein samples at a very fast rate, uh, at the time of one tenth of a femtosecond, very fast, one tenth of a picosecond, even then, it will take this much time, 3 into 10 to the power 20 years, to sample with this huge speed, to sample these, all these states of the protein. As I said, you don't have to sample all these states, you have to sample the 1% of the states. Even then, it's an astronomical large number. So, Levinthal then posed the problem. How does the uh, protein folds in milliseconds, uh, uh, in milliseconds, sometimes in uh, seconds, uh, fastest we know in microseconds, how does it fold so fast? That was the Levinthal paradox. Now, uh, now, very interesting, this is the story I always like to tell. This is the one with those days when I'm going to AI, first time to do this work. Uh, now I need my spec again to read Shakespeare. Uh, so I was in I did I didn't know anything of biology. To me, protein was a nitrogen containing compound. I had no idea of what is amino acid. Nothing. I, I had no interest of knowing amino acids at that point. But I went to NIH to work with a very famous time dependent statement, who is a legend guy, his name was one thing. And I started reading little bit of things of hysterine and all this thing. Bob Zwanz was very disdainful of my venture into biology. He told me, soon you know about proximal uh, hysterine, distant hysterine, all this kind of stuff. And he was less a... Uh, without getting any help from Bob Zwanz, I went to another person, you might know the name, Billy Jan, who was a lab chief. Bill, what, where do I start? Bill was equally disdainful of me. You physicists, 
Huh? I always tell you to start with what Mad Pursuit by Francis Crick. You know what Mad Pursuit is a book by Francis Crick, very famous Francis Crick. <coughs> I said you could be careful. But I have no place to go, so I started reading uh, what Mad Pursuit right now. Then those days I used to take a bus still you know, the MT4 because then I just no parking whatsoever. So in the bus I was happily reading what Mad Pursuit by Francis Crick. Then I found there is a chapter a Blind Watchmaker. It's a really nice story. And blind watch me. That my, one thing my father taught me very early, ninth grade. He used, he used to buy all the books for me. I, read, I talked about it in my autobiography in this space, right? Uh, all the books he used to, whenever he used to come to Calcutta, he used to buy me lots of books. And many of the books were old books from college uh, things because we are not rich. But this time he bought two new books. Completely new and <coughs> expensive books, penguin books. One is the origin of the species, another is survival of the fittest by Charles Darwin. So in the what my parts of Francis Crick, they have a chapter by Blind Watchmaker. But uh, then Blind Watchmaker is the name of a book by uh, Richard Dawkins, which is neo Darwinian theories. And then I went immediately for the uh, Blind Watchmaker book and started reading it. And in that book, he has a wonderful thing that Richard Dawkins, you might know, is a brilliant, brilliant, brilliant theoretical bi uh, biologist. Richard um, uh, Dawkins gave this example. What happened in, a, in late 19th century?